Hello everyone, happy first chapter Friday. A true story about a young man who suffered through family abuse. The great part of it is that he survived and his story is called A Child Called It. He went on to write a total of three stories and then his brother also wrote one. So please check them out. It's by Richard, I'm sorry, his brother is Richard Peltzer. But A Child Called It is written by Dave Peltzer. Chapter 1 is called The Rescue. March 5th, 1973, Daly City in California. I'm late. I've got to finish the dishes on time. Otherwise, no breakfast. And since I didn't have dinner last night, I have to make sure I get something to eat. Mother's running around yelling at my brothers. I can hear her stomping down the hallway towards the kitchen. I dip my hands back into the scalding rinse water. It's too late. She catches me with my hands out of the water. Smack. Mother hits me in the face, and I topple to the floor. I know better than to stand there and take the hit. I learned the hard way that she takes that as an act of defiance, which means more hits, or worse of all, no food. I regain my posture and dodge her looks as she screams into my ears. I act timid, nodding to her threats. Please, I say to myself, just let me eat. Hit me again, but I have to have food. Another blow pushes my head against the tile countertop. I let the tears of mock defeat stream down my face as she storms out of the kitchen seemingly satisfied with herself. After I count her steps, making sure she's gone, I breathe a sigh of relief. The act worked. Mother can beat me all she wants, but I haven't let her take away my will to somehow survive. I finish the dishes, then my other chores. For my reward, I receive breakfast, leftovers from one of my brother's cereal bowls. Today, it's Lucky Charms. There are only a few bits of cereal left in a half of a bowl of milk, but as quickly as I can, I swallow it before Mother changes her mind. She's done that before. Mother enjoys using food as her weapon. She knows better than I to throw leftovers in the garbage can. She knows I'll dig it out later. Mother knows most of my tricks. Minutes later, I'm in the old family station wagon. Because I'm so late with my chores, I have to be driven to school. Usually, I run to school, arriving just as class begins, with no time to steal any food from other kids' lunch boxes. Mother drops my oldest brother off, but keeps me for a lecture about her plans for me tomorrow. She is going to take me to her brother's house. She says Uncle Dan will take care of me. She makes it a threat. I give her a frightened look as if I'm truly afraid, but I know that even though my uncle is a hard-nosed man, he surely won't treat me like Mother does. Before the station wagon comes to a complete stop, I dash out of the car. Mother yells for me to return. I've forgotten my crumpled lunch bag, which has always had the same menu for the last three years. Two peanut butter sandwiches and a few carrot sticks. Before I bolt out of the car again, she says, Tell him. Tell him you ran into the door. And then, in a voice she rarely uses with me, she states, Have a nice day. I look into her swollen red eyes. She still has a hangover from last night's stupor. Her once beautiful shiny hair is now frazzled clumps. As usual, she wears no makeup. She's overweight and she knows it. In all, this has become mother's typical look. Because I am so late, I have to report to the administrative office. The gray-haired secretary greets me with a smile. Moments later, the school nurse comes out and leads me into her office, where we go through the normal routine. First, she examines my face and arms. 
What's that above your eye, she asks. I nod sheepishly. Oh, uh, I ran into the hall door by accident. Again, she smiles and takes a clipboard from the top of a cabinet. She flips through a page or two and then bends down to show me. Here, she points down on the paper. You said that last Monday, remember? I quickly changed my story. I was playing baseball and I got hit by the bat. It was an accident. Accident. I am always supposed to say that, but the nurse knows better. She scolds me, so I'll tell the truth. I always break down at the end and confess, even though I feel like I should protect my mother. The nurse tells me that I'll be fine and asks me to take off my clothes. We've been doing this since last year, so I immediately obey. My long sleeve shirt has more holes than Swiss cheese. It's the same shirt that I've worn for about two years. Mother has me wear it every day as a way to humiliate me. My pants are just as bad and my shoes have holes in the toes. I can wiggle my big toe out one of them. While I stand clothed, only in my underwear, the nurse records my various marks and bruises on the clipboard. She counts the slash-like marks on my face, looking for any she might have missed in the past. She is very thorough. Next, the nurse opens my mouth to look at my teeth that are chipped from having been slammed against the kitchen tile counter. She jots a few more notes on the paper. As she continues to look me over, she stops at the old scar on my stomach. And that, she says as she takes a deep swallow, is where she stabbed you? Yes, ma'am, I reply. Oh, no, I tell myself, I must have done something wrong again. The nurse must have seen the concern in my eyes. She puts the clipboard down and she hugs me. God, I tell myself, she's so warm. I don't want to let go. I want to stay in her arms forever. I hold my eyes tightly shut and for a few moments nothing else exists. She pats my head. I flinch from the swollen bruise mother gave me this morning. The nurse then breaks the embrace and leaves the room. I rush to put my clothes back on. She doesn't know it, but I do everything as fast as possible. The nurse returns in a few minutes with Mr. Hansen, the principal, and two of my teachers, Miss Woods and Mr. Ziegler. Mr. Hansen knows me very well. I've been in his office more than any other kid in school. He looks at the paper as the nurse reports her findings. He lifts my chin. I'm afraid to look in his eyes, which is mostly a habit from trying to deal with my mother, but it's also because I don't want to tell him anything. Once about a year ago, he called mother to ask her about my bruises. At that time, he had no idea what was really going on. He just knew that I was a troubled kid who was stealing food. When I came to school the next day, he saw the results of mother's beatings, and he never called her again. Mr. Hansen barks that he's had enough of this. I almost leap out of my skin with fear. He's going to call mother again, my brain screams. I break down and cry. My body shakes like jello and I mumble like a baby, begging Mr. Hansen not to phone mother. Please, I whine. Not today. Don't you understand? It's Friday. Mr. Hansen assures me he's not going to call mother and he sends me off to class. Since it's too late for homeroom class, I sprint directly to Mrs. Woodsworth English class. Today, a spelling test on all the states and their capitals. I'm not prepared. Usually I'm a very good student, but for the past few months I gave up on everything in my life, including escaping my misery through my schoolwork. Upon entering the room, all the students plug their noses and they hiss at me. The substitute teacher, a younger woman, waves her hands in front of her face. She's not used to my smell. At arm's length, she hands me my test. 
but before I can even take my seat in the back of the class by an open window, I'm summoned back to the principal's office. The entire room lets out a howl at me at the reject of fifth grade. I run to the administration office and I'm there in a flash. My throat is raw and still burns from yesterday's game, quote unquote, that mother played against me. The secretary leads me into the teacher's lounge. After she opens the door, it takes a moment for my eyes to adjust. In front of me, sitting around a table, are my homeroom teacher, Mr. Ziegler, my math teacher, Miss Moss, the school nurse, Mr. Hansen, and a police officer. My feet become frozen. I don't know whether to run away or to wait for the roof to cave in. Mr. Hansen waves me in as the secretary closes the door behind me. I take a seat at the head of the table, explaining, I didn't steal anything. Not today. Smiles break everyone's depressed frowns. I have no idea why they're about to risk their jobs to save me. The police officer explains why Mr. Hansen called him. I can feel myself shrink into the chair. The officer asks if I tell him about mother. I shake my head no. Too many people already know the secret, and I know she'll find out. A soft voice calms me. I think it's Miss Moss. She tells me it's all right. I take a deep breath wring my hands and reluctantly tell them about mother and me. Then the nurse has me stand up and show the policeman the scar on my chest. Without hesitation, I tell them it was an accident, which it was. Mother never meant to stab me. I cry as I spill my guts, telling them that mother punishes me because I'm just bad. I wish they would leave me alone. I feel so slimy inside. I know after all these years, there's nothing anyone can do. A few minutes later, I'm excused to sit in the outer office. As I close the door, all the adults look at me and they shake their heads in an approving way. I fidget in my chair, watching the secretary type papers. It seems forever before Mr. Hansen calls me back into the room. Miss Woods and Mr. Ziegler leave the lounge. They seem happy, but at the same time worried. Miss Woods kneels down and wraps me in her arms. I don't think I'll ever forget the smell of the perfume in her hair. She lets go, turning away so I won't see her cry. Now I'm really worried. Mr. Hansen gives me a lunch tray from the cafeteria my God, is it is it lunchtime already? I ask myself. I gobble down the food so fast I can hardly taste it. I finish the tray in record time. Soon, the principal returns with a box of cookies, warning me not to eat so fast. I have no idea what's going on. One of my guesses is that my father, who separated from my mother, has come to get me. But I know that's a fantasy. The policeman asks for my address and telephone number. That's it, I tell myself. It's, it's back to hell. I'm going to get it from her again. The officer writes down more notes as Mr. Hansen and the school nurse look on. Soon, he closes his notepad and tells Mr. Hansen that he has enough information. I look up at the principal. His face is covered with sweat. I could feel my stomach start to coil. I want to go to the bathroom and throw up. Mr. Hansen opens the door and I can see all the teachers on their lunch break staring at me. I'm so ashamed. They know, I tell myself. They know the truth about my mother. The real truth. It's so important for them to know that I'm not a bad boy. I want so much to be liked, to be loved. I turn down the hall. Mr. Ziegler is holding Miss Woods. She's crying. I can hear her sniffle. She gives me another hug and quickly turns away. Mr. Ziegler shakes my hand and says, be a good boy. Yes, sir, I'll try, is all I can say. 
The school nurse stands in silence beside Mr. Hansen. They all tell me goodbye, and now I know. I'm going to jail. Good, I tell myself. At least she won't be able to beat me if I'm in jail. The police officer and I walk outside past the cafeteria. I can see some of the kids from my class playing dodgeball. A few of them stop playing and they yell, David's busted, David's busted. The policeman touches my shoulder telling me everything is okay. As he drives me up the street away from Thomas Edison Elementary School, I see some kids who seem to be phased by my departure. Before I left, Mr. Ziegler told me he would tell the other kids the truth. The real truth? I would give anything to have been there in class when they found out that I'm not so bad. In a few minutes, we arrived at the Daly City Police Station. I sort of expect Mother to be there. I don't want to get out of the car. The officer opens the door and gently takes me by my elbow into a big office. No other person is in the room. The policeman sits in a chair in the corner where he types several sheets of paper. I watch the officer closely as I slowly eat my cookies. I savor them as long as I can. I don't know when I will be eating again. It's past 1 p.m. when the policeman finishes his paperwork. He asks for my telephone number again. Why? I whine. I have to call her, David, he says gently. No, I command. Send me back to school. Don't you get it? She mustn't find out that I told. He calms me down with another cookie as he slowly dials. Seven, five, six... Two four six zero. I watch the black dial turn as I get up and walk toward him, straining my whole body while trying to hear the phone ringing on the other end. Mother answers. Her voice scares me. The policeman waves me away and takes a deep breath before saying, Mrs. Pelser, this is Officer Smith from the Daly City Police Department. Your son, David, will not be coming home today. He will be in the custody of the San Mateo Juvenile Department. If you have any questions, you can call them. He hangs up the phone and smiles. Now that wasn't so hard, was it? He asks me. But the look on his face tells me he's assuring himself more than he is me. That's the end of chapter one, and that was uh, a bit into the future of his story. The rest of this book is telling how he was abused, when it started, and all the details. I have to admit, it's, it's the most shocking story I've ever read, and the fact that it's based on a true story saddens me to no end. Um, hard to believe, but at the same time, it, it's a biography. It was an actual thing that happened. What I love about the book is the hope that it brings, because I've already told you that he survives. It's right on the cover, One Child's Courage to Survive. And I know that if other people read this book and they're going through tough times, that it might give them hope that they too can survive and maybe take some of the resilience and all these other things that um, happened to Mr. Peltzer when he was a child to heart and maybe help them through their tough times.